Join Davy Jones for a look at Britain's most rambunctious redhead, Sarah Ferguson, on Meet the Royals, next on A&E. Here they come, walking down the street. They get the funniest looks from everyone they meet. Hey, hey, meet the Royals. They're nothing like you and me. A loaded with power and money. And chased by the paparazzi. Hey, hey, meet the Royals. Hey, hey, meet the Royals. Good Lord. Sarah, look at those photos. I've heard of dining on lady fingers, but Duchess toes? Hey, hey, Davy Jones here. Poor, fun-loving Fergie. In just 10 years, she went from palace favorite to royal disgrace, and she never knew what hit her. Welcome to Meet the Royals, where we give you a taste of palace life. The perks, the protocol, and the predicaments. Trouble is, commoners like Fergie don't have a clue what they're in for. Huh. And you thought being Duchess of York was a picnic? She was not sedate uh, and subtle. She was wham bam in the face. When she's good, she's very, very good. And when she's bad, duck. Fergie was never going to fit in as a member of the royal family. They saw her as an outsider. She remained an outsider. She was doomed. Let's sit back and watch what happens when an untamed royal named Sarah Ferguson is let loose inside the palace gates. Next, on Meet the Royals. Springtime at Buckingham, and who's the happy couple? It's Sarah Ferguson, a commoner who has bagged the ultimate bachelor, Prince Andrew, second son of the queen. The sassy redhead was storming the castle gates, and the world was there to witness it. Sarah was about to become a member of that exclusive club, the British Royal Family. Her own family was thrilled. There's Sarah, there's Andrew. They both love each other, and it's going to be an ideal marriage. They were friends as well as lovers, and I think that's very important. And it seemed that their union would last. Boy, was she wrong. Like a bull in a china shop, Fergie made a mess of her marriage and nearly took the monarchy down with her. But today, she's back on top. CEO of a major entity, herself. How did the daughter of a polo coach get to marry a prince? Why did the fairy tale fall apart? And most important, what do you do with your life when your last job was a princess? October 15, 1959, the saga begins. Sarah is born in London to parents Ron and Susan. Dad was an officer in Britain's household cavalry. Mom, a fun-loving society girl. She was a very funny person, wonderful mimic, very good hostess. They were a very glamorous couple, because he was uh, extremely good-looking, she was very good-looking, and they were the toast of the town. Sarah's father was also a star on the polo field, which is a good way to meet royalty. Horse racing is a sport of kings, then polo is the passion of princes. It involves hitting a tiny ball with a long mallet whilst riding on horseback at full gallop. Legend has it that Hannibal was the first to play polo, riding on the back of his elephants and whacking the skulls of his enemies. Prince Philip was the first royal to take polo seriously, followed by Charles, William and now young Prince Harry. And it's that heady mixture of machismo, money and royalty that gives polo watching a real aphrodisiac quality. Prince Andrew first met Sarah Ferguson, Prince Charles first met Camilla Parker Bowles, all on the polo field. The rest, as they say, is history. Polo brought the Fergusons within spitting distance of royal brothers Charles and Andrew. There were a few occasions when Sarah was up there watching me play polo, and then uh, Prince Andrew and Prince Charles came up, um, usually with the Queen. 
Although you could never say that Fergie was part of the Windsor set, really, she was around them a lot because work and play and polo was all part and parcel of the same thing. The family lived in London until Dad inherited a sweet home in the country and 900 acres to go with it. Sarah and older sister Jane were psyched. A happy, bubbling girl, always on the go, always determined to do as well as she could. She was a real little tomboy in lots of ways. She loved her little ponies, and she was always determined to make quite sure that even after she fell off, she got back on again. She would attack any fence, anything that was uh, smacked of, uh, of daring, and you could see it on her face. She was mischievous and fun-loving and full of courage. And her sassy personality took her school by storm. Our favorite pranks were antagonizing the teachers to see how far we could push them. We would just imitate them, which, which must have been so annoying and so irritating and so ghastly, but we thought it was hilarious. But at age 13, Sarah's happy home was shattered. In the summer of 1972, her mother fell for an Argentinian polo player and ran away to South America. So that's what women want. Yeah, I think it had a devastating effect. The studies went down quite a lot after her mother went. Dad thought she'd be better off with her sister at ballet school. Tutus and Swan Lake, it's a tomboy's nightmare. Sarah and Bally did not seem to go together at all. Sarah and Rounders, Sarah and Netball, Sarah and everything else, but not Sarah and Bally. It's just she just wasn't uh, her makeup, really. To make matters worse, Sarah was an awkward teen. And she obsessed about her weight, an insecurity that would haunt her for the rest of her life. She'd be wearing something, she'd say, God, does it make me look fat? And I said, no, 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 you look great. No, but you're not telling me the truth. It makes me look fat, doesn't it make me look fat? So then you feel you have to, in order to keep her quiet, say, all right, it makes you look fat. Oh, my God, I'm going to have to change, you know. Finally, it was goodbye school, hello, London. Sarah set her sights on the big city and a career in PR. But was her new boss ready for Sarah? She was pretty disorganized in those days, in a delightful way. She was scatty. She was a, a, a colorful, scatty 19-year-old girl. Fergie was very scatty. She was all over the place. She forgot things. Her, you know, if her button came off, it was, it was tied up with a safety pin. I mean, she just didn't care, which, of course, was part of her charm. When scatty Sarah went shopping for the boss, she almost sank the whole bloody business. Hey, Fergie, think you can pop out and pick up a fishing trophy? She was detailed off to go and find a very nice trophy. She went to the Crown Jewelers, and we were absolutely horrified that she had ordered this sterling silver, magnificent trophy, costing about 65,000 pounds. So she got away with it, but that was the sort of thing she, she would do. But she's always brilliant with people, absolutely brilliant. She focused on them, gave them their full attention, and that's why she was so good. In her 20s, Sarah's charm got her a string of good jobs, lots of travel, and plenty of boyfriends. But she was still looking for Mr. Right. Then fate stepped in. Fergie's friend Diana, that's Princess Diana, scored her an invite to Royal Ascot. She accepted and got more than she bargained for. I watched her as she walked around the royal enclosure, not on the arm of, but certainly close to Prince Andrew. Apparently, they'd had great hilarity while having tea that afternoon because Prince Andrew had stuffed chocolate eclairs ad nauseum into Fergie's mouth. Fergie thought this was bliss, A, because she loves food, and B, because it was a hoot. Let's get the stud stats on Andrew. Younger brother of Charles. Navy man. Helicopter pilot. Hero of the Falkland.
England's war and one of the world's most eligible bachelors, but not for long. It was a love match at the beginning. Sarah just finished a long-term relationship with a much older man who was never going to marry her. Then she met Andrew, and it just seemed like all her dreams had come true. She was quite happy to be with someone who actually built up her confidence rather than squashed her confidence. Prince Andrew did that for her. I think he made her feel great. Fergie was in love. And when the press found out, they hunted her like a pack of wolves. I warned her that never once, if she got engaged, will she ever be a private person ever again. Her father wasn't the only one worried whether the daughter of a polo coach could hack it as a royal. A hundred years ago, Queen Victoria in this situation would have just died because servants did not aspire to do anything with the members of the royal family, let alone marry them. And I think she, as nice as she was, I think she was quite unsuitable to marry Prince Andrew. Despite the doubts, the happy couple set a wedding date. They had been dating for nine months and seemed the picture of young love. But Fergie's free spirit was about to become caged in the confines of the castle. to meet the royals continues here on A and D. As the wedding day approached, England got to know Fergie, and they liked what they saw. She was a free spirit and a breath of fresh air. She was so different from uh, anyone else who'd ever come near the royal family. The fact she had a weight problem and wore bad clothes made her very attractive to many people. They liked the fact that she had red hair and she laughed too much. And so she was very appealing to the British public. The Brits loved Sarah, despite her lowly roots and string of ex-boyfriends. Besides, Andrew was no angel either. Nicknamed Randy Andy, one of his past girlfriends was a soft porn star. So I guess you could say they were made for each other. He enjoyed her rather zany humor. He loved her spirit, and to begin with, of course, they all loved it. Prince Charles used to say to Princess Diana, God, why can't you be more like Fergie? I think they learned not to feel that way in the end. But at the beginning, she was, as the Queen put it, a breath of fresh air. By wedding day, Fergie mania had swept the nation. Inside Buckingham Palace, hundreds camped overnight to catch a glimpse of the bride in the glass coach. The massive cheering crowds as we drove down the Mall and down Whitehall. Uh, unbelievable. Absolutely fantastic. I remember turning to her and saying, look, all these people come to see you. When you're a royal, there's no such thing as a small wedding. Nearly 2,000 guests jammed Westminster Abbey, including a couple celebs. A princess-to-be has to keep up appearances, and Fergie slimmed down for the big day, losing 26 pounds to fit into her dress. It was decorated with an A for Andrew and a 17-foot train. That's eight feet shorter than Diana's, by the way. Andy's mom gave him a special present before the wedding, the titled Duke of York. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love, cherish, and to obey. To love, cherish, and to obey. At 12 noon on July 23rd, 1986, the marriage license was signed, and Sarah Ferguson became Her Royal Highness the Duchess of York. Does that say spinster? How rude! Outside Buckingham Palace, the crowd clamored for the traditional royal kiss.
Their honeymoon began aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia. The newlyweds were the only passengers, but not for long. The in-laws showed up five days later. A month later, Andrew returned to the Navy and Sarah to Buckingham Palace. The honeymoon was over, not just with Andrew, but with the press as well. Fergie, look out! First, they attacked her clothes. I think the media compared Sarah with Diana, and that was a very odious comparison. We were merciless, and I think, you know, she must have been extremely unhappy about it, because we'd had, by then we'd had a good five years of the glorious Diana in her wonderful wardrobe, and we expected Fergie to be as good. When that got old, they attacked her bulging waistline. I was looking for a line, a phrase to describe her, and I was saying, Duchess of York, what goes with that? And some clever wit in the office said, what about Duchess of Pork? And I thought, brilliant, used it in the, in the paper. And of course, she was stuck with that name for years and years. I think the British public really expect you to become regal overnight. They want you to be a princess. They want you to throw away your personality and all your own clothes uh, and to become uh, this doll. And Fergie wasn't quite capable of doing that. Uh, she has hair which she can't really properly control. Uh, the clothes never looked quite right and they didn't fit because she was overweight. Uh, and she would laugh this raucous laugh. Uh, and she didn't conduct herself with the kind of royal demeanor which everybody expected. We made her a princess. Now we wanted her to be a princess. Every time she opened her mouth or sneezed or turned round, uh, they were there. The Rat Pack was there, watching her. To make matters worse, her new home was more dungeon than palace. Life in a palace may seem like a many-splendored thing, but in reality, Buckingham was kind of creepy. Gloomy rooms lit by 40-watt bulbs, and don't you dare open the curtains, Fergie. That would ruin the view for the tourists. Andrew's disappearing act made the big house even emptier. The first year they were married, they only spent 48 nights together. Now, that is not a good recipe uh, for a marriage, particularly with a hot-blooded woman who wants company. He was never there, and she couldn't cry on his shoulder, and she couldn't say, they've been mean to me, they've done this to me, they've done that to me. And it just wore her down. She was so desperate to connect with Andy that she even learned to fly a helicopter, just like him. I'm constantly surprised by her. She does everything very well indeed. I'm, I, I just, um, I now know exactly what he's talking about when he goes out on the sorties, so that's what I wanted to achieve. And if being a naval wife was tough for Fergie, being a princess was a bit overwhelming. You meet heads of state and you are entertained at state banquets and you fly all over the world and you are uh, married to the second son of the Queen of England. It is a very heady experience. People curtsy to you, people bow, and uh, you are the Duchess of York. She was really dropped into the Royal Roundabout too quickly. She hadn't had enough um, training, shall we say, or experience in royal life. I think she did say later the only thing they ever told her was to wave more slowly. Fergie attacked her new job like a bulldog in a butcher shop. Up at six every day, she had a full calendar of royal ribbon cuttings and formal dinners. She remembers changing clothes four times a day. No easy task when each change takes an hour. And she ended each day at midnight, writing endless thank you notes by hand. Clearly, she had bitten off more than she could chew. She went to excess as soon as she got married. It was like a child in a sweet shop. There was everything there to indulge her. There were palaces, there were yachts, there were expensive cars, and seemingly everything was obtainable in that shop if she just reached out and grabbed for it. 
And when people told her to slow down, Fergie told them to take off. Well, what happened was Fergie went on behaving like Fergie, although she was a, a royal duchess. And because that was her, that's what everybody liked about her. So she couldn't suddenly change overnight. She was not going to be pushed around by uh, courtiers at the palace. She was going to do it her way. And so if she received advice that uh, was uh, conflicting with her natural instinct, she would tend to disregard it. Bad idea, Fergie. Exhibit A, the dog. And she did do some rather stupid things. She once um, knighted a little dog. She said, arise now, Mr. Dog, <laughs> Sir Dog. Which, of course, is very funny, but of course it got in, into print. <laughs> I think it would have flown pretty well in America, but it just didn't hear. People don't like to see the British royal family having a good time. Exhibit B, the royal knockout. Fergie involved herself in a television program called It's a Royal Knockout, uh, where people were running around all over the place and making idiots of themselves. It was a perfectly innocuous program, but for some reason, the British press decided to turn on her. They were looking for her to make gaffes, and so they went for her. With the best blue bandits are on. <laughs> It did actually alter the public's perception. There was nothing wrong with the program. Sarah was absolutely fine with it. But from that moment on, things changed. The press may have turned against her, but lucky for Sarah, the Queen thought she was a kick. The Queen's husband, Prince Philip, was another story. He cannot stand Fergie. And he's very honest about it. He said, early on, when things started to go wrong, he said, either she's in or she's out. She can't have it both ways. And as far as I'm concerned, I want her out. I think pretty soon he realized that um, his new daughter-in-law was as bad, if not worse, than the first one, Princess Diana. Prince Philip saw Fergie undermining the royal family. Remember that he came from a, a Greek royal family that was kicked out of its country. Everywhere he turned, everything he did was to try and uh, strengthen the British royal family. And he saw Fergie letting the side down. He wanted her out, and he wanted her out quick. By 1988, things were going sour for Sarah. Pregnant with her first child, she put on over 50 pounds. Andrew, away in the Navy, returned only briefly to watch daughter Beatrice being born. Sarah missed him desperately. Six weeks after giving birth, she joined him in Australia for five days of royal duties. When Andrew returned to his ship, Sarah stuck around, following him from port to port. On the advice of the palace, she had left baby Beatrice behind with the nanny. The decision backfired big time. She delayed 16 times before coming home, and she was away so long, the British press treated her as a woman who had abandoned her child. But she did desperately want to be with Andrew because she'd seen so little of him, so that was tough on her. But the crack was then wide open. She was a person to be hated. The sharks were circling for Sarah, and the fairy tale marriage was going down the drain. So, you want to be a princess? Well, be prepared to dress the part. Fergie reports that when she was a princess, her closet contained 90 dresses, 150 day suits, 60 hats, and 200 pair of shoes. You see, she had to change two to four times a day for the various events on her schedule. Now, like all the royals, she had her own dresser. That's a person, not a piece of furniture. And one of their jobs was to keep track of what she wore every day, just to make sure that when she was going to a charity event, she wasn't wearing the same outfit she wore the year before. That would be absolutely ghastly. Mind you, it seems to work for me. On their wedding day, Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson were on top of the world. Only three years.
years later, their marriage was falling apart. Andrew, a Navy man, was out to sea. And Sarah was drowning in an ocean of royal duties. She didn't really quite understand the rules. She didn't want to understand the rules. And to be fair to her, uh, the British royal family didn't understand her. They made no attempt to embrace her. They saw her as an outsider. She remained an outsider. She was doomed. One saw and heard one's daughter desperately upset. And all I longed for was Andrew to come back, or when he was back, to stand up and be counted. That's what she needed desperately. Abandoned by her royal family and hunted by the press, Fergie was starved for company. She found it in Texas oil billionaire Steve Wyatt. It was Dallas Meets Palace when they became friends. But when they started vacationing together, tabloids assumed the worst. Then another cowboy rode into town. His name was John Bryan. The tabloids pounced on Fergie's bald boyfriend. Though she denied any romance, it was clear her marriage was in trouble. And the press chased them like a stampede of Texas Longhorns. Sarah wasn't the only one with a royal marriage on the rocks. Fergie and Di, both miserable, got desperate. They took a turn to the spooky side, visiting astrologers and mystics. I am Basel. For six years, the Duchess of York told me about her palace life. She told me about your royal family, her marriage, and all the men in her life. The Duchess of York, it, it was very, um, Fergie to me, very out of character, because we, all, we didn't take ourselves too seriously. And suddenly, there was a side that was saying, well, I need a mystic and I need a faith healer. And, and you know, they're trying to say, come on, you don't need that. You just need to be you. Come on, come back and, and let's have a laugh. Finally, Fergie had reached the end of her royal rope. She decided to call it quits. She wanted to do so well and she tried so hard and actually she did do very well. But she rubbed everyone up the wrong way. She was too much of a free spirit. And when she finally realized that, she decided to get out. Sarah and Andrew decided on a trial separation, a last ditch effort to hold the fractured fairy tale together. The palace broke the news with its usual decorum. But when a BBC reporter snuck off for a private chat with the Queen's press secretary, boy, did he get an earful. And it was way too juicy to keep to himself. The knives are out for Fergie at the palace. Uh, I have never known such anger here at what has been going on. But all kinds of uh, comments are being made about the unsuitability of the Duchess of York for royal life uh, are now being made in, within the palace. Well, of course, the establishment is very ruthless. And the establishment does play to win. And once the knives come out, they're not sheathed again unless there's blood on them. The palace would not be satisfied until Fergie was gone for good. And she soon gave them the perfect chance to slam the door. Oh, Baldy was back. Sarah and John Bryan were spotted together on an island off the coast of Thailand. Then it was off to Saint-Tropez. He explained that he was just helping the Duchess get away for a bit. And I said, but it is being said very heavily, John, that um, you're having a sexual relationship with Fergie. He said, oh, don't be ridiculous. It's nonsense. I'm a very good friend of her, but I'm equally a very good friend of Prince Andrew. And in fact, he said, you know, I'm even speaking to the Queen and I'm involved in any um, negotiations that are going on to try and get the Duke and Duchess of York back together. The crisis diffused, the royals, with Sarah, headed to Scotland for their annual holiday. At 10 o'clock one evening, the phone rang. It was John Bryan. Some photos were about to hit the newsstands, he told Sarah, and they weren't pretty. The next morning at breakfast, the bottom dropped out of her world. There, the entire royal family was flipping through the tabloids, staring at risque photos of Fergie and John Bryan. 
she was completely and utterly humiliated. And I remember her telling me that when she came downstairs that day, she looked around the room and thought, but there, for the grace of God, go the lot of you. God, this can't be John Bryan, can I? So what's happening? He's playing with the children. He's behaving like their father. So I realized we'd absolutely struck gold. They became known as the toe-sucking photos. For the record, Fergie insists that there was no toe-sucking going on. They were simply playing Cinderella. But that doesn't really matter, does it? The photos made the front page of every British tabloid. It was the biggest circulation booster of any story or pictures in the history of mankind. They're probably the most embarrassing pictures ever taken of any member of the royal family. And, I mean, she'll never live them down. This is the sad part. This whole incident was just so humiliating and so embarrassing. And, and it really just... It, you couldn't humiliate anyone more than she felt. She really felt just absolutely horrendous after that. Well, God, how totally unnecessary. And one sat back and thought, now how on earth are we going to get out of this? And the answer is, well, one didn't get out of it. <laughs> Disgraced, Sarah left Scotland. It was hard to imagine things getting any worse, but they would. I love that the story Davy Jones here. It's your favorite part of the show, and someday I hope it'll be mine as well. M versus M. Monkeys versus monarchy. Are you ready? The Queen has ladies in waiting. The monkeys always had ladies waiting. Ouch. I impersonated a prince on episode 21, while William is a prince who's just turned 21. And finally, Peter Talk, Duchess of York. Need I say more? I hope not. Nineteen ninety-two was a bad year for the royal family. Windsor Castle burned, Princess Anne got divorced, and both Charles and Andrew split from their wives. But nothing, absolutely nothing, could top the toe sucking. This was embarrassment taken to a whole new level. Those toe sucking pictures were, for some reason, almost the worst royal scandal since the abdication, and I don't know why. It's because they, they were just so prolific. It was something that any of us could have done. What do you suppose that she's thinking? Her Royal Highness was cut off from her royal duties and fell into a deep depression. She said to me that she couldn't even get out of bed. She was really depressed. I mean, she just hated herself, and she just wanted to go under the floor and die. One month after the photos appeared, Sarah was scheduled to give a speech for a charity she supported. She wanted to skip the whole thing. Instead, she gathered her courage and faced the crowd. And here I am today, your voice. I will continue to honor that promise for as long as you wished me to. She was so brave to stand there on the stage and face everybody. It was one of those moments that really made me love her a lot. I couldn't believe she could be so courageous. It took a lot of guts to get up there that day. It seems that a little bit of royal stardust had rubbed off on Fergie after all. Now, with newfound confidence, she turned her talents to charity work and displayed a rare sensitivity for the children with the greatest hardships. We were taken to the old gym in which were some very, very severely mentally handicapped youngsters, refugees from over the Bosnian border. And the powers that be did not want her to go into the gym. And I was sort of saying, you know, hold back, hold back, because it just might be dangerous. Um, but <laughs> she will never take a telling like that. She just walked straight into that gym. 
And these people were rushing up to her, they were clawing at her, they were pulling at her hair. And within about three or four minutes, she was on the floor with them, holding their hands, eye to eye, soul to soul. Charities gave Sarah a reason to keep going, but they didn't solve an old problem, spending money she didn't have. No, Fergie, don't! When a children's hospital needed $25,000 for washing machines, she paid for them herself. And she didn't hold back when shopping for number one, either. She went on shopping sprees, particularly in Manhattan, and she'd buy 50 or 60 pairs of shoes in one go, that sort of thing. I, I don't think she did that deliberately. I think that this poor girl was so distraught with what had happened to her that this, you know, she binged on food, she drank too much, and she went on spending sprees money that she just didn't have. And I think she felt she had a sort of standard that she'd become used to and she wanted to to stick to that. And I think also she was compensating, perhaps, for the girls. And she wanted them to have the best and the most and wanted to make them happy. By 1995, Sarah's overdraft reached nearly $6 million. She was flat broke, and the queen refused to bail her out. The trial separation with Andrew was heading toward a sad finale. The two of them never fell out, but he was away a great deal. And things kept going wrong in her life because she wasn't used to being told what to do, and she wouldn't buckle down to the system. And she tried very hard. And I think perhaps she tried too hard. He was prepared to endure uh... Sarah's infidelities simply in order that he could keep his household together and two he didn't want to go through a divorce he felt that would be humiliating and so he clung on in there even after everybody else was saying uh, that Sarah had to go anyway the children are well I'm well Duke's well everybody's well and we're just getting on with it it's entirely enough to be a personal thing between the Duke and I to make a clean start, Sarah knew she had to make a final break from the palace. She and Andrew divorced on April 17, 1996. With her new title, single working mom, she was on her own. How do you see your future after the divorce? Take every day as it comes. Every day is a new day. There are trials that change bread. You'll never want to be without. Bring the British monarchy into your castle. Order this episode of Meet the Royals on VHS for only $24.95 plus shipping and handling. To order, call 1-800-423-1212 or shop online at AETV.com. Ferguson's official title is Sarah, Duchess of York. She's no longer Her Royal Highness, but she managed to keep the Duchess bit even though she lost the Duke. Now, here's where it gets interesting. If Andrew should marry again, his new wife would also be the Duchess of York. Imagine dueling duchesses duking it out, the yin and yang of York. Fantastic! It sounds like that could be a TV show all by itself. <laughs> Today, Sarah Ferguson is a new woman. She has a new children's book, hot endorsement deals, and even photography credits. But wait a minute. The last time we saw Fergie, she was divorced, in debt, and disgraced. How did she get out of that one? Well, it wasn't easy. There is a lot of fight in her, and she thought, I can't. I've got, you know, I've got two children. I can't just curl up and die and disappear. You know, my, my mother-in-law is the queen. I, I cannot, I've got to pull myself out, and I think it was sheer willpower that she did. At the end of the day, she's not prepared to accept uh, the brickbats that have come her way, and she may be knocked down and bruised, but she gets up again. And I think that's an admirable quality. First, the debts had to go. What does an ex-duchess do to bring home the bacon? The answer, endorsements. 
Vienna, where she got 80,000 bucks to appear at a mall and an opera. Then, a commercial for Ocean Spray, making her the first British royal to endorse a product and scoring her a cool half million. Night Star gives me a real zing, especially when I serve it with ice. It's harder than having a thinner mother. It's harder than being called the Duchess of Pork. Certainly. Then she hit pay dirt, becoming the U.S. spokesperson for Weight Watchers. Introducing 123 Success. It's a real dark breakthrough. From Weight Watchers. As Fergie raked in the dough, America cheered her on. The Brits did not. The extraordinary thing is that here in Britain, we look down our noses at Fergie. We have a slightly snooty approach to her. We don't think she's done the right thing. In America, you're admired for being successful. In England, people are jealous if you're successful. But we got the wrong approach. America absolutely sees her for what she is. She dumped the husband who's useless. She lost the weight. She's got a job. She earns millions. Uh, she's doing a great job, and she's bringing up her children very well. She's an extremely concerned mother. She's a single mother doing a great job. You go, girl. Does she live in the shelter, this little one? If America saved her bank account, it was charity work that saved her soul. I have a little girl who's your age. What is their greatest fear? Is it the police or what is it? Sarah has founded two charities, Children in Crisis and Chances for Children. Together, they have raised over $25 million for children in eight countries. I've seen her sit down on the floor of a cellar in St. Petersburg with a gang of young boys and talk to them and get to know them. They don't necessarily know that she's a duchess. She has this amazing empathy, this warmth, and a genuine um, interest that they respond to. And while Fergie is busy saving the world, what's the ex-husband been up to? Andrew likes to play golf. He likes to watch television. He's pretty much a couch potato. The British press have tried to dress him up to make him look uh, more exciting. But then he'd put on his golfing clothes and he'd slope off to the golf course. Uh, and he would just become the boring couch potato that he is. Andrew's place in history will always be of the cuckolded husband, which is very unfortunate for him. But that is the memory that one has. Unless he goes on to do stupendous things. That will be the memory that Andrew was the one waiting while his wife parted with other men. Ouch! That's got to hurt. Still, the two have managed to stay on good terms, even though she makes millions and he still lives off an allowance from Mom. They have this very close relationship without being married, uh, which does seem extraordinary to the outside world, but it works. It works for them. I think Andrew's behavior right the way through has been absolutely fantastic. He has stood by through thick and thin, and he's had quite a lot to stand by. And I think he's been absolutely fantastic. So are they getting back together or what? I don't think there's any chance they'll get back together, because Fergie simply will not, very sensibly, go back into the royal fold. So there's no chance. Her relationship with the rest of the royal family remains cold. Christmas holidays are especially icy. Since her separation from Prince Andrew, Fergie's been exiled from the royal family's Christmas. But her daughters, Princess Eugenie and Beatrice, well, they're invited every year. Now, the royal family Christmas is this curious mixture of fun and formality. Unlike the rest of us, they tend to open their Christmas presents on Christmas Eve. It's a tradition they first introduced by Queen Alexandra a hundred years ago. And they might be one of the world's richest families, but the presents are eccentric rather than expensive. I remember one year, Prince Andrew gave Diana a pair of false plastic bosoms, and Diana gave Princess Anne a doormat. And as for the royal corgis, they get on the act too. They get stockings filled with dog biscuits. And as for royal entertainment, well, they shoot pheasants during the day, and they play charades at night. And they've even got their own private cinema. And with 25 butlers on hand, there's always someone there to hand out the mince pies. Christmas, Beatrice asked her mom why she wasn't good enough to have dinner with the Queen. How do you answer that? Fergie doesn't have any sort of future with the royal family. She's the ex-daughter-in-law of the Queen, but she is the mother of two of the Queen's grandchildren, and therefore she can never be completely done away with, as many would like. 
Despite the royal rub-off, Sarah is determined to raise two proper princesses. And she has begun to bring Beatrice on the Fergie circuit. In her heart, she'd like to be a great charity worker, because she's absolutely brilliant at that. And she's a great speaker. It is up to you to make the choice to want to change. She has found some peace somewhere, and I think she's genuinely really quite content with her life at the moment. One thing's for sure, this fiery redhead has come a long way. Congratulations, Fergie. It looks like you're finally finding your place in the world. Uh, are your scandal stays behind you, or is another chapter just around the corner? This is Davy Jones. Whatever happens with England's most notorious royal redhead, we'll keep you posted on Meet the Royals. There are trials that change the law and impact the way we live. The truth has got to come out. I didn't pull a trigger. Get closer to the victims. The accused, the lawyers and judges, these are their stories. American Justice. Wednesday at 9, only on A&E. So, you have a choice. We have real butter, 